Hey y'all, this is Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit the thumbs up button and you subscribe, and definitely make sure you ask questions in the comments or at my email address. So this episode is actually part two of a two-parter. Part one is right there. I'm putting, <laughs> put a link to it. If you didn't watch part one and you don't know what neural networks are and how cars do self-driving and so forth, I highly recommend pausing this video, watching that one, and then coming back and uh, continuing on with this one. Otherwise, you know, feel free to watch this one first and you can watch the other one later. No big deal. Uh, anyway, okay, so this part of it is why is Tesla leading in self-driving cars? And are they leading, I guess, is a good question. I would contend that, yes, they are leading in self-driving cars for a number of reasons. So uh, let's go into that. Is This is like, you know, this is how this stuff works on a pretty granular level, not like down to the lines of code, but it gets into specific things. So I think this is hopefully helpful for people to learn a little bit more about how all of this technology that's changing our lives all the time is actually functioning. So... Um, I think the first thing is, I, I don't know if I heard this or if I came up with this myself. If I heard it somewhere else, I apologize for stealing the idea. But it, it is that Tesla is not a car company that's making software like maybe Ford or GM or Chrysler or something like that. They were all car companies long, long, long before they you know got into software. But Tesla is a software company that is making cars. And that is a big, big difference. That's that's a whole different mindset. And 20 years ago, that would have made no sense whatsoever. But in 2020, and even in the 20 teens and so forth, that really starts to make sense because you're talking about um, cars are becoming less about automobiles that are just getting you from point A to point B, more about computational stuff. And that's not just true of Tesla. Like We're talking about cars ever since fuel injectors, electronic fuel injectors, came about in the 1980s or so, uh, there has been a growing need for embedded chips. There's the, the airbags that are in your car, the auto, you know, backing up things that warn you if somebody's behind you. There's lots and lots of embedded chips in all kinds of cars these days. So it's not just Tesla, but that gives them a really big advantage because they are a software company first in a way that is making cars. So I would say that's the number one advantage. Uh, the second advantage, which people have argued back and forth for years, is that there is a big advantage to doing video-based vision versus LiDAR-based vision. Again, if you watch the first episode, LiDAR is a laser system. You may have seen cars like Google Maps cars and a bunch of the Waymo, things like that. They have kind of a little like semi-dome thing on top of the car, and it, it has a spinning laser. If you have a like a Neato uh, Botvac or something like that, they have that too. They have LiDAR inside of their things, and they have a little, there's a little turret, and the laser spins around. And what it does is it shoots out rays, and it determines where everything is around it. Uh, it would seem that that's a big advantage, but there's two, um, well, three really big, really big disadvantages to it. Number one, it's very expensive. Um, number two is it's kind of tweaky. They can break easily, and if they break, then it's a very expensive repair and so forth. And number three <laughs> is that it's not necessary. And that's pretty much what Tesla has proven just in the last year or two. They've taken a vision-based system, which basically means they just have a bunch of cameras. They do have radar systems and so forth too to, to help out. But they have a camera-based vision system that operates like a human eye, except that they have a bunch of cameras instead of just two. And they are able to manipulate the data and they're able to um, understand the world. As I was saying in the previous video, there's that um, taking pixels and turning it into what in the world is that? Turning it into something that is a logical object which it can then act on. And so Tesla has proven that video-based systems actually work. Uh, because of the next thing I'm going to talk about. But given that, I mean, video cameras relative to LiDAR systems are dirt cheap. Um, and even if one breaks or something, you can easily fix it. It's not uh, it's not a multi-thousand dollar repair. Uh, so that's a big advantage. Okay, how has Tesla proven that vision-based systems work? Data. As you might have guessed from the last video, data is king. And Tesla has more cars that have auto-driving capabilities on the road than anybody else. And they're basically using the driver, person, people driving the car, 
are actually feeding them data that is helping them train their cars to get better. Um, I think they have kind of like a, it's not a simulation mode, but it's sort of like a, a safe mode, maybe something like that, where the car is actually predicting what it would do if it was in charge of the car. And as a person does a different operation or something, that either goes back to Tesla directly or it's being learned by the, the, the information in the car. But I think for the most part, it's going back to Tesla. And they're saying, given these discrepancies, which one was the right decision? I mean, <laughs> human beings being human beings, a lot of the times it might be that, that the autopilot was correct and the person made the wrong decision and did something stupid. But you know, did but got away with it. But it also could be a situation where, again, there's something like a mail truck is stopped on the side of the road, there's a double yellow line, and a person just goes right around the mail truck. And, you know, the classic sort of trained AI system would freak out at that problem and it would stop and it would just wait for the mail truck and you would be a very frustrated passenger. You'd become like, come on, man, I got to get to work. I can't just sit there behind the mail truck for the next 20 minutes while it stops at every single stop sign or uh, every single mailbox. So anyway, so I think that that's actually crucial. Tesla also has an acquisition system. It's kind of a machine that builds the machine. So they have things, I know I saw something about uh, semi-obscured stop signs. So that would be like if you were driving up and there was a tree branch that was growing over a stop sign so you could only see a part of the stop sign, that I know that was a big problem for their self-driving cars and they were able to use the data that was out there and they were able to acquire lots and lots and lots of data about those particular things by training a machine to learn when there was a semi-obscured stop sign so that they could then go out and they could, you know, train on that. So that's super, super cool. And that's like critical to being able to do this because if you think about it, like, like getting 90% of self-driving done is well, okay, it's hard, but but it's been solved. That's already a done deal. That last 10% or that last 1%, that is really, really, really hard. And because lives are depending on it, you can't just be like, ah, eh, 98% is fine, right? You know, it's, it's close enough. It's like, no, people are literally going to die if you're only 98% there. So they have to get to 99.99999, you know, percent there. And that's where all of this stuff comes in. And that's where being able to acquire specific data for specific reasons is so critically important. So yeah, uh, you could think about this as kind of a crowdsourcing, right? They have, um, they, they're able to utilize all of their drivers as a way of crowdsourcing data acquisition. So that's super, super important. And it's extremely economically efficient. It's extremely uh, temporally efficient. You know, there's a lot of things that go on. Just imagine like if you had a company where people would pay you to give you data, that's like, that's what Tesla's in. And that's, that's pretty cool, right? They got something good going on there. The next piece of this puzzle uh, it has to, again, it has to do with data, but it's learning. Most companies use supervised learning, which we talked about again in part one, and that's where you have to label all of the data. It's safer, it works well, but labeling is super, super hard. It's very time consuming, it's very expensive. Tesla uses mostly unsupervised learning, um, but again, with the ability to pinpoint problem areas via like a second learning algorithm that can be semi-supervised and can learn a particular area of problems and then it can apply this unsupervised learning to that problem. So again, semi-obscured stop sign, uh, maybe a person in dark clothing who's by the side of the road, right? You know, those kinds of things. Those are hard situations and by being able to go out and access all of that data that's there and suck in the specific instances that they need, they can get really, really efficient in terms of training and, uh, you know, <laughs> everything works much better. So that's a huge advantage that they have. And the last thing that Tesla's really got going for itself is they've got their own chip. They originally used NVIDIA and I can't remember the year, maybe 2018 or so. It was around the time the Model 3 came out. They started uh, creating their own embedded chips that are very, very specific to Tesla. It's super important. They run very, very quickly. They do only exactly what they need to do. They only use like integer math. They don't do floating point math. Uh, I think that they take the high resolution video images and they kind of crunch them down to some extent to make it easier for the processor to deal with. But this is super important because that high speed purpose built chip is just firing away in there and it's doing 
a way better job than a general purpose chip could do. In addition, they actually have two embedded chips with two completely separate power sources, completely redundant, and what happens is those two chips both feed data to the main computer that makes a decision about what to do. And if those two chips don't agree on what they see or what the decision is or whatever, the computer throws out that frame. So, you know, if you're dealing with 60 frames a second, a frame thrown out is not a big deal. So it goes on to the next frame and it decides what, what it should do from there. So that's really critical is that ultimate redundancy between the two chips so that if one fails or something goes wonky, there's another chip that's like hanging out there and it's like, I got this. Um, if you think about it, this is kind of similar to the way that rockets work. I think the space shuttle, for example, had like three computers and they would vote. And as long as two of them agreed on the decision, that would be the decision. Uh, so if all three of them disagreed, then it would have to throw that out and decide again. But that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So cars are not quite up to the standard of rocket ships, but they're still having two completely redundant computers inside of your car is really, really important. And that's a huge advantage again. You can't overstate the safety factor in having voting computers that are tallying their results and making sure that they agree with each other. So again, really, really big advantage. Um, these uh, The chips are actually being built by Samsung, but they're designed by Tesla for themselves. And I would assume that they either have some sort of like PRAM inside of them or that the chips, more than likely they have that. They have some sort of like a firmware reset where they can actually rewrite what's going on inside the chips. Uh, it might be that the chips themselves are just burned in and that's what they have, but I really doubt that because Tesla does over-the-air software updates all the time, and my assumption is that they're getting into the embedded chip and they're like rewriting some of the embedded chip code. So hard to know without being inside Tesla's company, but if anybody from Tesla wants to make a comment about that, please let me know. I, I would love to, to know about that. So anyway, that's my contention is that overall Tesla is way ahead of other companies in self-driving car cars. And that's a lot because of vision, a lot because of the system they use, a huge amount because of the data, but also the way that they train their um, algorithms and the fact that they have purpose-built high-speed chips that are working all the time that they're working on to improve. I think all of those things give them a huge advantage over other companies, and it's gonna be really hard for other car companies to catch up with them, particularly on the data acquisition front. It's hard to catch up. <laughs> Believe me, I know, I collect data for neural networks and stuff, and collecting data is a bear. So if you have the data, you have a massive advantage. I think Tesla's got the advantage. That's my thoughts. If you have a different opinion or if you agree, whatever, let me know in the comments. I'm very curious. I would also love to know another business or another area that you would be interested in finding out about how AI works in that area, in that business. Um, please, by all means, ask me. I, I would love to like continue on this series. I think it's a fascinating area to look into is like how exactly does AI work in a specific level for real world applications. I think that's super cool. So anyway, if you enjoyed the video, definitely hit the thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and definitely ask questions here or at my email address, which is knows at gmail.com. Till next time, thank you. Bye-bye.